Um, I'm going to turn it over for the first time ever, appearing live on Conversations with CAG-T, our wonderful, beautiful, talented executive director, Nanette Jones. So hi everyone, and I wanted to be on tonight to welcome you to our one year anniversary of Conversations with Tag T. I can't believe it's been a year. The first one was May 5th, Cinco de Mayo of 2020. So I am Nanette Jones, the Executive Director of Tag T, and it is my pleasure to bring you these conversations every week, and especially this session with our incredible panel discussing the topic we all need to hear, where we are currently in the field of gifted education, and where do we need to go? But a little background for you. Over 40 years ago, a handful of passionate educators who understood the importance of supporting our gifted learners got together and decided to start a nonprofit organization to, get, to advocate and focus on the needs of these learners, and CAGT was born. Currently, we have close to 1,000 members and still growing. Over 850 participants attend our annual conference each year, and even with COVID, our first virtual conference was a huge success. When COVID hit, we wanted to help our families at home learning and curated tons of resources to put on our website. But the face-to-face -face piece was missing for our parents and educators. When the idea to start Conversations with CAGT came to my mind, I reached out to Miranda, our communications co-chair and your host tonight, to see if we could do all of this on Facebook. And she said, I believe we can. So after board approval, here we are, 46 conversations later, each session reaching thousands of people locally, nationally, and internationally, and consistently having viewers from Australia, Puerto Rico, Brazil, and our friend Aileen from Malaysia, and more. We can't believe how successful it's been and the impact it has had on our GT community. Educators have even asked, if, asked us if they could share information with their staffs. We can't begin to thank all of our incredible speakers for their time and expertise that they so graciously give us each Tuesday night. And for all of you for joining us Tuesday night each week to hear our next conversation, learn and feel connected with our GT families. We hope you're enjoying attending conversations with CAGT as much as we have enjoyed bringing them to you. After tonight, we have five more sessions before a short break until we return again, August 3rd, for season two. I will now turn this over to Miranda Harper, who has been our amazing host since day one, and the incredible panel of Linda Silverman, Jim Delisle, Gil Whiting, and Dina Briez. Thank you for being with us. Enjoy. Thank you, Nanette. Um, what a great recap of all the wonderful things that have been happening in the last year. Um, I was a little distracted. I was responding to uh, so many comments already on the Facebook page. We have people joining us, as Nanette said, from us all the way from Australia and Malaysia tonight and across the Colorado area. If you are joining us, check in. Tell us where you're coming from. We would love to know. Um, how far and wide we are reaching uh, with this wonderful distinguished panel tonight. I think we're going to start off the evening um, by just going around and letting everybody have an opportunity to introduce themselves. So I would like to go in the order um, that I've kind of seen you all on my screen. Um, just a, a brief introduction of who you are. Um, many people joining us probably already know you. Um, and Anything else you'd like to share about yourself? Um, so we're going to start with Jim tonight. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. And secondly, congratulations to CAG-T for not just this session, <clears throat> but what you do year round. Uh, like a lot of the folks on this panel, I'm one who uh, travels a lot, used to anyway, travel a lot to different state conferences. And I, I would say this even if I was someplace else, Colorado does it best. So you folks really need to have a lot to be proud of. Uh, anyway, Jim Delisle, this is my 46th year as an educator, that's crazy, and 44 of those have been with gifted kids. Most of the work I do is on social and emotional needs of gifted children, and if I had to take one thing I was most proud of in my career, 
it's that even as a university professor, I taught middle school gifted kids uh, one day a week for the majority of my career, about 20 years out of the 25, I was a professor. And next week will be my last day of teaching as a high school teacher of gifted kids here in where I'm based now in South Carolina. And uh, so it'll be a grand uh, closure to a fabulous career. So anyway, thank you for the invitation and look forward to tonight. Jim, thank you for being here. Um, we are gonna move on to Dina. Dina, if you would introduce yourself, please. Hi everyone, following Jim Delisle's, you just don't wanna do that much, but I am the director of, of gifted school, gifted programming in Paradise Valley School District in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm also the gifted program coordinator for Arizona State University's master's gifted program. And I'm currently serving on the NADC board as the governance secretary after having served two terms as a school district rep. So obviously I don't sleep enough, um, but this is my passion and um, I just love working with all the wonderful folks in the field. And like Jim, thank you for the invitation tonight. Thank you, Dina. I'm very excited for this evening. Um, we're gonna go um, down to Linda. And Linda Silverman, if you would please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Linda Silverman. I'm the founder of Gifted Development Center. And I was one of those people way back over 40 years ago who helped to start Colorado Association for Gifted and Talented. I think I was the second member. Um, and I'm so proud of Tag T. I'm just so proud of all the things. I agree with everything that Jim says. I've been everywhere and boy, we do it well here in Colorado. It's just terrific. So um, I've been around a long time. Um, the center, Gifted Development Center, will be 42 years old in June. And uh, I also was a university professor at the University of Denver. Um, but I think my happiest moments were like Jim's when I was teaching gifted kids. And I loved doing that. And had anybody told me that getting a doctorate would keep me from being able to be in the classroom with the kids, I wouldn't have gotten a doctorate. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. And I agree. That's the best place to be, right there with the kids. All right, moving on to our last. He, he wanted to go last. So, Gil, I wish granted. Gil, what, would you yourself? You know, it wasn't for the introductions. It was for the tough questions so I could think for longer. <laughs> okay. I'll but I, I, I'll, I'll let you go with this one. Uh, good evening, everybody. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And if you're not watching this live and re rebroadcast, thank you for tuning back in. I think what they're doing in Colorado is a great gift for all of us who are involved in the field. I think so many of the people I've gone back and watched over the last year have given me information that I can use and I find that very useful. So I want to thank you all for selecting out of all the people that you could have selected that you brought us together. So I feel that we have a good, uh, powerful uh, posse here panel tonight and hopefully we can uh, answer some of your questions. I'm Gil Whiting. I'm a professor at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm the director of what we call the Scholar Identity Model and Scholar Identity Institute. I'm the director of graduate studies for the African American and Diaspora Studies program here. I'm also a co-chair for NAGC's uh, Diversity and Equity Committee. So I've been working across the spectrum from special education to gifted education for the last 25 or so years. And I'm honored to be here tonight. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Uh, and Gil's been in the comments already. He is a social media pro. Um, if you are joining us tonight from Kentucky or New York or Ontario, Canada or Sydney, Australia or Malaysia, please, as we go along, please put your comments and questions in the chat. Interact with us. Uh, we have a couple questions we're going to try to address throughout um, the evening, but if your co questions come up, we are going to try to address as many of those as we can in the hour that we have with you tonight. So we're gonna jump right in um, and kind of just take a little uh, temperature check of everybody here and of your experiences in gifted ed. And Linda has been uh, in gifted ed for, for, she's claiming seniority this evening. I think she's might have Jim beat by a year or two. <laughs> So 
Um, Linda, I'd like to ask you this question, then we'll move around to everyone else. Um, in your time in the field, what do you think is the most important shift or change that you've witnessed in gifted education? Well, I've actually been in this field since 1961, and I have seen a lot of changes. Um, some of them are good, and some of them aren't, in my opinion, anyway. Um, I'm a licensed psychologist, and the field began in the field of psychology as an interest in individual differences. And I think we've lost that psychological foundation which is very important because that helps us to understand the inner world, what Jim was talking about, the social and emotional development of the gifted. He and I share a passion for that. Um, when we get too focused on the achievement of the kids, we forget that these are whole people and that they feel different. So what, what I've seen as the biggest differences is um, that the internet connected parents of the gifted in ways that they were isolated before. It's also connected gifted kids in ways that they have been isolated before. Um, and I think that having the parents connected by internet changed an awful lot of the ways in which the even the schools have started working with the children so that there are more alternatives and there's more opportunities <clears throat> that are happening even outside the school, like the Davidson Young Scholar Program. And the parents are able to support each other through internet. And that's been a big, a big difference. The, when I started, there was a great deal more isolation. But we had a better idea then of what we were talking about when we said gifted. There was more consensus of what giftedness was. And so when you would read a research article, pretty much the research was talking about the same population. That isn't true anymore. And that's one of the biggest problems, I think, with the newest uh, reports that are coming out that are challenging gifted education. So I will pass on to somebody else to answer that. I'll go next because I have, I think, the second to seniority to Linda. <clears throat> and Linda and I did not rehearse our responses, but we might as well have because they're very similar. Uh, as she said, as Linda said and has said for years, this field of gifted started in the field of psychology and it morphed into the field of education. And instead of being a field that is really looking at who the children are as people, who they are and what they do, we now look at them as talent, uh, talents, as kids with achievement needs. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, we all want kids to achieve. But what I find happening, what I found happening over the past decade or more, is that once we move closer to the talent development piece instead of the psychological piece, we lost our identity, at least in part. Because you name me. I, mean, I was a special ed teacher for kids with disabilities before I got into gifted. Even then, I was a talent developer. There was not a teacher on earth or a parent who was not a developer of talent. So when we focused so heavily, as we still do, I think, on the talent development piece of gifted, instead of who the kids are and what their psychological, social, and emotional needs are, I think we've given up part of our identity. And I'm going to do a shout out last week, or earlier this week, actually, I visited virtually uh, Wheat Ridge High School, and I know Lisa Lee is on this is on this uh, Facebook page, and she had a panel of high school students who spoke about what they were doing in, in gifted, and I've, I've known Lisa and her work for years. I just want to share with you one thing, when there's a question that I asked, which was, how would your life be different if gifted didn't exist, if you weren't in a gifted program? And this is a young man, I just wrote down what he said, I'm not trying to be dramatic, I'm just reading what he said. He said, I would be nowhere the person that I am today without GT. I might be dead. I can't put into words how important GT has been to me. And I think we lose some of that when our focus is so curriculum driven and less driven towards the child himself or herself. 
Thank you, Jim. You always have the best student insights to share. And I think those are some of the most valuable um, and, and the things we learn the most from. Dina, would you like to share your perspective? Sure. And I'm going to go from a school-based pers perspective of the, the, the psychology university and background there that they provided. Actually, I'm learning just already just listening to you. I didn't realize that the origins were in psychology to that extent. But what I'm seeing is the important shift as, an, as a school administrator is uh, three things that come to my mind. First of all, the, the absolute increased attention toward equity, diversity, inclusion has made us consider adopting and adapting new methods for identification, but also practices for providing gifted services. Um, we get stuck in a lot of the past, the way we've done things. And so when we're trying to um, make our, our services more inclusive, we lose sight that we have to actually change what those services are and make them student-centered as opposed to adult-centered, practitioner-centered, what this, this, the school wants to see. Um, and another one the way to do that, which is also an emerging trend in the last several years, and I think it's just going to continue to grow, is that the schools are using um, local norms, especially building norms. I've been doing this for 20 years, and now all of a sudden it's gaining so much more momentum. And I do think that that is going to change the, 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 the landscape, also a, a mind shift in, in, in the, that we as educators need to have. Um, we have to start identifying new opportunities for these students that we're calling gifted instead of sticking them into the, the box the way we've always done that. Um, and I'm going to speak more about this a little bit later, but um, the other, ben the other uh, trend that I or shift that I've been seeing is that the benefits of, and I'm just thinking about this COVID year that we've just gone through, but I have seen a lot of benefits in the tech integration that we, in my practice, in my school district, we've been integrating technology forever. But um, I think it's allowing us to have different, provide students with different opportunities that they didn't have before. Um, and not just like, how we what we're teaching but how we're seeing the students we're we're able we're, there's more flexible grouping less than extensions there's more uh, student collaboration so there are some some benefits that that um that i see as part of the shift that's going to continue and making some of those collaborations even stronger than than they were before okay so uh so miranda I, i'm not going last anymore uh after this because uh they they sucked all the air out of the rooms so have to figure out some things but thank you no seriously no i i concur with its origination and 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 all that and and the, the, the stanford uh crew and uh, uh johns hopkins and all that I, I agree with the psychology aspect of it and i also understand that the the, the exchange the between what's happening in the uh, uh field of psychology in the in the field of education i believe that when we're talking about how someone is positioned in terms of the academics i think the coming together of the fields is something that was bound to happen and needed to happen in a certain kind of way to achieve the things that dean is talking about which looks at diversity equity and quality because what's happening is the society is changing so in the 1960s we could do certain things a certain way and really, there were people who were left outside and couldn't say anything about it. But now I'm working with gifted students or students with gifts and talents, students who are achieving high. If you look at any scale they're measured on, they're really looking at what's happening in a society. So as Dean was talking about with technology, also becomes social emotional, as uh, um, uh, uh, Jim was talking about, with regards to what kids are taking into schools with them. So our students with gifts and talents are now dealing with the social emotional piece of what's happening in the society so we have to make sure of what i don't think is happening yet is that our educators needs to make that shift as well a lot of people talk about this about the, the hyper uh connectivity that so many of our talented students have uh the emotional piece to have uh to society and what's going on but yet our teachers still teaching in that bubble type atmosphere. So I think we're in a transition now. I don't think that the last year can be measured other than what Dina talked about with regards to COVID-19. 
uh, the loss of learning, particularly for those who don't have great connection with terms of internet or access, those kids, black, brown, native, uh, low income kids who were separated from the teachers, from the classrooms, fell further behind and how we're going to actually reintegrate them into the classroom. That's going to be the next challenge. So the, 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 the shifts of gifted education in my time have been an awareness to the whole picture of giftedness, whether it's, as we said, whether it comes down to uh, universal or whether it comes down to building or whether it comes down to measuring kids in a classroom, uh, whether it's looking at kids with low income backgrounds and saying, hey, if this kid scores in a 75, 80 uh, here, and this kid scores a 90, those two are equivalent in some kind of way. So we have to think about all of the new people and all new factors and all new variables, meaning children that we're looking at so we can find some of those who are truly missing from this, this process. And I think I'm gonna, you touched on a lot there, Gil, and so did Dina, um, about kind of what our next question is going to be about. And all of your perspectives are so interesting and different, but also connected because, because I think when we come down to it in gifted education, we are talking about meeting the needs of the whole child. And the whole child includes their, their backgrounds, their, their needs, their culture, their social emotional needs, their cognitive needs. Um, and so I, I, I love all your different perspectives. Um, Dina touched on it and then you did too, Gil, about our next question. And it was posed by um, Heather Baskin, a colleague of mine um, on the Western Slope. And um, she asked, what are some of the positives and negatives of the last year? And, and Dina kind of touched on those, on some of the positives and Gil kind of touched on some of the negatives. But if we could maybe expand on that, and Dina, I'm gonna go straight to you since I was kind of thinking about that question when you were speaking, um, and then we'll move around the, around the screen. Oop. Once again, from a school-based perspective, um, what I'm seeing in the schools is really exciting because for the positive, I'm seeing all of a sudden educators have to become more flexible, but the kids have to have, have become more flexible. The kids have become more self-reliant because they've got to figure some things out on themselves with a colleague, with a chat per, per person in their, in their chat room. Um, they've learned to become more adaptable because the teachers, teaching has had to change. And I've seen, my teachers have, have noticed that the kids have become a lot more empathetic and there's a lot more compassion with each other because their feelings are, have changed. And so they're becoming more sensitive with each other. And I think that's really impacting some of the, um, the way they see each other. Um, the, uh, another way uh, for a uh, positive trend, is the new ways to collaborate like we were just talking about and that has opened some doors some teachers have been doing working with this ways of uh, new innovative ways to collaborate for many years but it's been forced upon others and so i think it's a whole learning process uh, for the schools that they've had to become more innovative in their approaches to learning and um we that's all innovation is always great with gifted kids because they're going to innovate that for themselves but i think that that's what i'm seeing is a outcome of some of this, the reality that they're in. And it's not all negative. Uh, there are certainly some of the negative things like the lack, some, some school districts have actually uh, dropped away from their gifted services or lessened them, or the kids have, you know, left feeling like, like Jim was saying, without gifted who, you know, my life, my life is different. So that is a negative because I do talk to people around the country or around my state and I hear, oh, we had to cut our gifted teachers. We had to cut this because they didn't know how to deal with it. This is an innovative time. We have to figure out how to deal with it so we can buffer some of those negative outcomes that, that we're kind of naturally expected to see when kids are learning in isolation. We, as educators, can change that for them. And the other negative thing that I see on a daily basis is that teachers are exhausted. And when teachers are exhausted, they are not as creative and energetic and they're planning with some with kids as, as sometimes so that's a negative thing but also that we can try to support differently and we don't know what the future is going to look like at this point but we do know so, that we can learn from some of these lessons that we've been experiencing 
and for the better, for the good and the bad. Thank you, Dina. Um, I'm just going to hop over to Jim. Um, if you could respond, what positive and negatives that you've seen in your work with students? Uh, honestly, I think it's in many ways still too early to tell what the long-term effects of this past year will bring. Um, the kids who have benefited are the ones who probably were more advantaged to start with. They had the right connectivity. They had uh, the wherewithal for how to change their manner of learning the way the teachers are changing the manner of teaching. That's certainly not universal. I'm not talking about gifted kids. I'm talking about uh, just students in general. My wife is the uh, CEO and president of an agency in New York, and I'm sorry, in Washington called uh, All for Ed. And it's basically an equity-based uh, organization. And just the degree of kids of all races, but especially black and brown kids and native who do not have access, or have not had access this year, and kids who are lost, literally, they have not shown up for a whole year. Uh, I think the impact and the effect of what this year has been is really going to be tough to measure. And so if we try to go in now, as some states are trying to do, and say, let's do annual assessments to see how the kids have performed Again, I think the kids who are the most advantaged are going to show up doing well. But that is, to me, not, a neg not necessarily a positive indicator of what this year has been like. And just one vignette uh, of a, a boy I'm, I, I'm teaching this year, and uh, his name is Jeremiah. And it was early on when everything was, had gone virtual in our school. And so it was my first or second lesson with him. And Jeremiah was at home alone with his twin two-year-old brothers on his lap because his parents were working and here he was trying to be at a school for gifted kids, learning something high level, needing to take care of his twin two-year-old brothers. I don't know what Jeremiah's uh, learning is going to be. How can, how can we measure him this year? And that's my concern is that we're, I think too many folks who are policy driven are going to say, we need to know how kids have done academically when I don't know that whatever measure we get is actually going to be accurate. So I'm, I'm struggling to find a positive. I'd like to, because I'm usually an optimistic guy. But right now, for my own students, I'm, and as, as Dina said, how many exhausted teachers there are. The kids are exhausted too, for different reasons. And so I think the jury is still out on what will happen. But again, that focus on social and emotional needs for all kids coming back is, is going to be paramount. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I think you address some of the major concerns that I think a lot of educators um, in the classroom have had, uh, at least in my experience. Um, Linda. I concur with Dina about how exhausted the teachers are. I, I have a group of child-centered uh, gifted educational leaders that meet monthly, and they're always talking about how it's just wiping out people. and. The, the, the difference between those who have access to technology and those who don't have ju has just spread the gap between the haves and the have-nots in a, in a very cruel way. But I'm also aware that this has been a traumatic year for a lot of people who have had losses, personal losses, uh, families with uh, limited resources don't even have homes. They've been kicked out of, of their living situation. So for us to be thinking about achievement and testing and performance, when we really need to be dealing with mental health issues and post-traumatic stress disorder, that was a comment that was made in one of the wonderful sessions that Donna Ford uh, put on. Uh, I think it was called Black Minds Matter. And it, it's true. We, we need to be aware of what kind of a toll this pandemic has taken on people's living situation, on the loss of their loved ones, not just on their achievement. And we have to have mental health practitioners able to deal with these losses. Thank you, Linda. I'm gonna go on to um, 
Gil and let you share. I didn't mean to leave you last again, Gil. You're gonna go first next time. You noticed that, didn't you? Okay, um, well, I'd like to pick up something in the chat that Rebecca Cole said Thank was, how do, we, yeah, how do we measure the psychological impact of this year on students? Well, one thing I did personally, and I think what I'm, I've noticed over the years was that the, a lot of populations I work with tend to fall off during the summer months. We all know that children, period, uh, tend to take a long break in the summer. Well, if, if you think about it statistically, if you're already behind during the academic year and you fall further behind in the summer, I know my daughter goes to these enrichment programs her whole life. When she comes back to school, she's not even on par. She's actually ahead of where she was when she left school. A lot of the kids I dealt with, and a lot of kids in this, in this situation, um, low income kids particularly, tend to fall further behind. So what I tried to do last summer, and we're doing again starting in a couple of weeks from now, right after Vanderbilt's graduation, is have programming that can actually bridge some of those gaps. So keep the kids engaged psychologically, socially, as well as just, you know, they have energy. Kids have energy to burn. And if you put good people in front of them and they're creating these uh, relationships, uh, the rigor will come. But if they're creating these relationships and the, and the, the curriculum is relevant to what they're doing, uh, then they'll, they'll show up as well. So everybody's tired uh, and everybody's got COVID head and everybody's got Zoom faces and we get that. But that's just, we're all in the same boat. But I always like to use this analogy, but some of us are up in the, you know, the $24,000 suites and some of us are down by the coal room. And I, I like to focus on the kids who are below decks a lot of times and say, how do we get them at least at deck level, you know, so they can get some fresh air. And, you know, you got kids who are sitting by, it's interesting that in uh, Minneapolis, I went up there last year during the, um, the murder of George Floyd and went to the place where it happened. And there was a couple of kids up there who actually were, uh, going near the cup foods and doing homework, sitting outside of that same little grocery store for internet, right? And these kids are highly intelligent. I'm thinking about Jim and some of the stories he's telling started making me think about kids in particular. We've got a young man here in Nashville, his name is by the name of Kansu. And he's a, I mean, this kid is off the chart, un outstanding. He's a brilliant little kid. He just named valedictorian of his class. He's probably only, uh, 12, 13 years old, and a little kid could probably do college level work right now. So he is off the hook. But at the same time, he, he you can talk to him and see the, the psychological disengagement. So and back to that question about how do we measure it? I go with the gym says that what we do know is that if we don't do something to intervene, then the measurement, once we finally get it two or three years from now, how many children more will we lose to this? Because we already know that uh, uh, in, in terms of the kids I work with primarily, uh, jumping into gifted and talented programs for them tend to be a, a tough haul because they tend to be the only one or one of very few. And um, if they're falling behind in the summer, they don't want to face that again in the fall. So we have to do something to keep them up to, up to snuff, if you will. Can I respond to that for a sec? Um, one of the things that we have to keep pushing out in the schools right now is that that we have a ton, a boatload of money coming from the CARES Act. The schools have ESSER funds that they have more money than they know what to do with. So we just need to work with people in the Department of Ed and to, to try to direct some of those funds to these kids that Gil's talking about. And to looking at, and a lot of, a lot of what we're focusing on right now is the social emotional aspect. But also there's opportunity here that we did not have before because schools always cry, we don't have any money to do that. Well, I say, you don't need money. You need to allocate your existing resources. But now um, is a an opportunity that, that I think the schools have to create. And I'm seeing a lot of people talking, hearing a lot of people talking about what we're gonna do in the summer to address some of these things. And I've been working, I'm working with our Department of Ed to, to with work groups to, to try to, create opportunities so that we can help mitigate some of those losses that we know are there and the ones that we don't know that are there because what's going to happen when we come back in the fall if we come back face to face and everybody is there that range of ability of achievement of development is going to be so much broader than it was before and that's when Jim was saying we don't know it's too early we don't know but we have we there's things that we can put into place right now to try to try, try to um, make up for some of those 
inequities that we know that are happening in um, the schools. Right now, I had a, I was just meeting with a parent uh, who during COVID, they were going through a divorce. So this child going into kindergarten was going into the self-contained first grade. He hadn't made any growth. And it's like, do you realize that this is super accelerated? And they said, neither of us have worked with him at all. I said that the entire time. Nope. He logs on, he get, does his work or he doesn't. And this is a five-year-old. How many five-year-olds are out there? And this is the huge time in their learning um, in their development that between kindergarten and first where they need a lot of one-on-one, -on -one. they need that somebody to help teach and listen and understand. And so that's, it's a, in a vacuum. And so what I'm most concerned about is what it's gonna look like when the kids go, to, go back to school and those who have hovering parents that are you know, doing everything they can and given every opportunity to those on the other end of the spectrum. But yeah. we have money to address that. Could I respond, Dina? Uh, I was just listening to uh, NPR today and the Columbus, Ohio Public Schools uh, superintendent was on and their annual school budget is about $700 million. And the Cures Act is giving them between last year and this about $400 million, which is awesome. However, I'm wondering if, and I, I wanna again address this to you as a, someone who works full-time in the schools, are we going to hear the same thing like, well, these gifted kids will make it on their own. Let's give the money to kids who really need it. I mean, we've heard that for years. Is it going to be even worse now that so many kids are needing a whole lot more attention? Well, I think what Glenda was saying, we're focusing on the whole child and there's been so much attention toward the social emotional development. And what are these kids missing in their lives? But also like I was talking before about this trend using to using local norms and building norms. I want, I want to test kids and say, who, the, who from these results, I don't care about the national norm. I want to say in this building, who are the kids that need this the most? So if we can get away from that, you know, you need 97 in this area to, to, to get services, then I think the money is going to impact more kids because we're looking at more kids on a personal level to see where they are and, and what they need. And I think that's really important that the two are playing together. So I don't really care that they are gifted. What I care is that every kid is getting what they need. And if we keep using those local norms area, because we have Native American schools with our Navajo Nation here in Arizona, they're not even back to school. They didn't go back the entire year. And so if we look at those kids and say, we know that they have those gaps, but they, they're also getting a lot of money. I think we have to look for the kids where they are in a different weight frame or perspective than we did before uh, the pandemic. I think we have a, I, Lisa said, um, Lisa Hampton commented, she said the fallout from this year is unknown, but what we do know is it's going to take all of us to make sure that kids get what they need. And no finger pointing, just we need to be unified in making sure that all of our kids, when they come back, they get what they need and we meet them where they're at. Um, I'm gonna shift because we have about 20 minutes left and <laughs> Gil's watching the time, he's like, man, um, we could probably be on here for a long time. Um, recently in the field of gifted ed, there has been a hubbub of uh, conversation and response and activity around a report. Um, it was it, in the um, Heshinger report, it was an article um, on some research done with regard to gifted programs. And the study suggests that gifted programs are not yielding the academic benefits that one might expect, um, especially for students of color and low income students. So, um, I think we're all familiar with, with uh, at least on the panel. If you're not, I will put the uh, link in the in the chat so you can read the article we're going to be discussing. Um, it's a very brief article, but um, what are the implications of this study, and uh, how does the field of gift education respond to these concerns? So I'm Gil. I told you I wasn't going to make you go last, so I'm making you go first. I think this is strategic. <laughs> I think I think it's strategic because. Uh... Uh, one of the authors is actually a colleague of mine here at Vanderbilt, and uh, the other one is actually a fellow alum from Purdue uh, with regards to the response to that article written there. 
Um, so let, let's, let's try to take it um, this way and say, I don't think the field should be surprised by the report. There's nothing in that report that surprises me. As, as a researcher, if we take anything apart, we can see how it could have been better. It was limited in the way it was done. Uh, was it actually asking the questions that it purports to have answered? So there for me is, is one, of the, one of the big deals. But also I wanna make sure that we keep in mind that historically, uh, the, 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 the definition of what happens to a group of folks, uh, in this case, black, brown, low-income, native children, tends to be decided not by any of them. You know, when we have a teaching force that has less than 2% of uh, black males in it, in places like Minnesota, 0.5%, uh, we have to look at the, the, the work that's done about teacher matching and those things there. We also look at about the, 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 the relevance of the education of the teachers. What are we measuring? Why are we just looking at, again, if we're looking at the whole child and we're looking at the development at, why are we just looking at math and reading? And the scores for across the board aren't great. So because this population is doing worse than the larger, po the white population, is no surprise because it's been that way since the beginning. So I don't see any uh, major shift there. Um, I do know that without having, and I'll come back to this, I'm gonna stop because I want other people to weigh in. I do know that without making some kind of shifts with regards to teacher training, as well as diversifying the teacher force, we're gonna keep getting these same kind of reports coming out. Uh, this is new data that a couple of folks looked at and somebody replied to, and I just look at it as a, um, another one of those, okay, another, another point of data to look at. And I don't, yeah, it shouldn't turn us on our heads or make us stop doing anything that we're doing. I'll stop there for a second. I'll, I'll go next. It's um, actually just seconding what Gil said. I wasn't surprised at all by the results of this study or whatever it was. Uh, and part of the reason I'm not surprised is that our identification processes and our curriculum options after the kids are identified have never <laughs> aligned or very seldom aligned. We identify kids usually by test scores, by numbers and all that, and then they all get the same program. It's almost like, you know, you give kids a swimming test and depending how well they do, you put them on the soccer team. It's like, uh, wait a minute, there needs to be some connection here between why we identify and how, and then what we do with the kids when we find them. And this goes something back to something Dina said that I want to emphasize because it's something I focused on in virtually every time I've done an audit of gifted services, and I've done many of them around the country, they use national norms to identify their kids. But you know, our kids don't go to school nationally. They go to school locally. And so what a population for gifted kids is in one town may look very different than it is in another town by the identification label is what I'm saying. And so that may mean, and this is uncomfortable, that you could be gifted in one town and not in another. And I used to be really, really against that. But now I see that it might make sense depending on what assets certain districts have and don't have. So if we, get, we still have to identify the kids, at least I believe we do, but at the same time, what we do with them should mesh with how we identify them. And again, it's often time, you know, give them, a swim, give them a swimming test and the best kids get on the soccer team. I just don't get it. And the low use of local norms, even building level norms like Dean is talking about, I think is one way to really address this issue in a powerful way. I'd like to just say that we're not looking at the whole child. If you ask a gifted kid, why do you like gifted programs? Why do you like going to be with the other kids? It's the other kids. Mm -hmm. It's their feeling of belonging. They finally have somebody who will laugh at their jokes. Did they do a test to measure the improvement in the self-concept of the child, in the child's sense of connectedness, and not being an outsider, not being ostracized. Well, I mean, whoever said 
gifted programs were supposed to increase reading and math scores anyway. If you wanted reading and math scores to improve, then you accelerate the kids. But that isn't the basis for why we develop gifted programs. We develop gifted programs for different purposes. And this, to me, this research was completely irrelevant. But it did also, it, it did also remind me of something that George Betts used to say. It points out that being gifted on Tuesdays isn't going to do a whole lot. You want, you want to see big changes in kids, they have to be more than gifted on Tuesdays. If I can add one, again, another personal comment from one of my students. Uh, the, kid, the school I teach at right now is, uh, it's a public school for highly gifted kids. Uh, and it's the kids at the high school is based on a college campus. It's a very small school of about 200. Uh, the kids start taking college classes as ninth graders. And by the time they finish their high school career, they're already three quarters of the way done with a college degree. And it's all paid for by our school district. It's an amazing school called Scholars Academy in Conway, South Carolina. But these kids are used to being the smartest kid in the middle school. And then they come to this school where everyone is the smartest kid, if not smarter. And so I asked the kids one day, the second day I met them, I said, when you walk into this building, do you feel any differently than when you walked in last year's building, your middle school? And I'll never forget one ninth grade girl who said, when I walk into this building, I can exhale. And if you do that, just... She just felt like she belonged. And I think that's something we can't measure by a stay nine or an achievement test score. We so seldom give import. Jim, I'll tell you, I'll tell you where we can measure it. We can measure it, as we all know, when you get to the university level and we have made such a thing about it in the K through 12 level and they get there, like I say, and now you all of a sudden you walk out with your bat and it's only like a little teeny mm -hmm. little, little slug and everybody's out there been slugging. Now you're in the real mix of things. So again, talent rises and AP and advanced classes and things like that. Those are where, and those actually have more uh, segregation, unfortunately, than does gate classes. And re realistically, it's like throw them all in the water, like you said, and see who swims. And then you find out the ones can be on a swim team, not on a soccer team. Love the analogy. So I'd like to jump in and add that I, I always, in a lot of presentations, I always call this dilemma, gifted program, the dilemma between the chicken and the egg. Because what schools do is they've got this pro, gifted program that they've been doing, you know, the Tatwati thing for 28 years, like when I walked into certain districts. And then they cherry pick. They look for kids that fit into that program. That's right. Where I take the opposite approach. I like to look for potential in kids and then modify the programs to see and group the students together, teach the teachers what they need to do, look at the curriculum that the kids need. So I've been able, because I'm in a fairly large district of 30,000 students. So I've been able to create a continuum of services. So I had that self-contained for highly performing gifted kids who have to have a 140 plus. Actually, Linda, you've tested some of them because I get your tests on them a lot. But I also, in all my title schools, I use those, those building norms to we call it flex kids in so they're still in the gifted program but they're not near those the same levels and then there's all these levels in between so schools have this opportunity to reach kids where they're at and develop that potential they're at look at build that social emotional support and for those highly gifted or the twice exceptional which i have a lot of i even have a program for twice exceptional ki gifted kids and that's a whole different training set and a whole different resources and needs but we have to look at the, at the child, figure out what they need, figure out what we can do with what we have. And then it's a beautiful thing because you're, they're all gonna be able to exhale. And I, have to, I have to say something because I was so excited with what you just said. Uh, Rita Hollingworth said that the school has to adapt to the child, not the other way around. And these programs that pick kids that fit what they want to do with them make me crazy. And I've, I've, also, I've also seen a lot of schools picking children on their behaviors oh, yeah. uh, or programs. Oh, yeah. you know, they, they, sit, they, do, they, 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 they sit straight in the chair, they, they act a certain kind of way, and that kid who's bouncing off the walls, we're not looking at twice exception. We're not looking at income. We're not looking at all these other variables that are there. So we're, again, we're missing a lot of them. I think back, and I just say that uh, the very few 
teachers I remember, I can recall from K to PhD, I had three who were black. And I can remember each and every one of them. And I had to reflect on that while I was thinking about this, this conversation. And I had to ask myself, why do I remember these people? Because you know, when I was in first or second grade, I'm not conscious of race and culture. It was that something that person did to me, for me, with me, that helped me to remember them. And that's something we need to do about that relationship. So I go back to that saying that fitting in and being made to feel comfortable in that space, then you can truly blossom. But when you're constantly walking there, looking over your shoulder, do I belong here? Then there's another issue that's there as well. So I just wanted to bring that. Can I, and I, I, don't, I don't often interject um, my personal like practitioner experience, but one thing I think, and you've mentioned relationships, you mentioned we're not only gifted on Tuesday, you mentioned this programming needs to meet the needs of the individual student. I think one of the challenges, and this is a challenge that I see in, with my colleagues, is when you have 200 students on your caseload, those relationships are a challenge. Meeting the programming is a challenge. When you are serving K-12, 200 plus students, I think inequity exists in that we are trying to meet the needs of a bunch of students and find students that we want to find but we are stretched so thin because there's no federal mandate for gifted education. Some states don't even have funding. How do we measure whether gifted programs work when kids are only gifted on Tuesday? And so I guess my follow-up question to you, and I see Gil's like ready to respond. My follow-up question to you is how do we increase the efficacy of programs for gifted students when it is a back burner education issue? I'll just jump in real quick and say that I think the measurement comes in the future. We can't measure it right now. One, that's the real, the real truth of it is we can't measure it right now. I think what we can do because of that large caseload, I remember going into my 20 something anniversary uh, reunion, whatever, and, um, or was it 30? I can't remember anyway. And I ran into my guidance counselor and he was like, oh, so what did you do after school? What did I do after graduation? This is my guidance counselor asking me what I did after school because he had 400 kids, right? So I don't expect the guidance counselor, those, those people in those positions to know anybody. But guess who's there every day? In the classroom, how do we develop talent in our teaching staff? How do we develop them to be talent scouts and teach, teach, teach work with kids with self-efficacy and helping them with their future orientation and those things there? And that's what I talk about all the time. How do we make those people interact with the students when they get in the smallest group, which might be anywhere from 30 down to 10 or 15, how do we te make those teachers, whether in gifted or not, become those folks that can become talented? And I'd like to make, I know we're running out of time, but just two short points. And the first one is a shout out to Dina. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Dumbing Down America. And I highlighted one district in the country that I thought did gifted education services the best. And it was Dina's district, Paradise Valley because it's a cascade of services they offer. It's not just a Tuesday gifted program. It's for twice exceptional kids. It's for the highly gifted. It's, I mean, what Dina does on a regular basis, not only how many years you've been there, Dina, but it is still a paramount program in the country. It's powerful. Uh, and the second thing is just a quote that I use all the time from a man named John Gowan, who maybe Linda will remember, but nobody else will. Uh, John Gowan My was- advisor. <laughs> he was uh, very much into the counseling aspect of gifted children. And he said something once that I think still applies today. He said this in 1970. And listen to this and see if it doesn't apply today. He said, gifted education is a passionless issue in a society geared to emergencies. Ooh. Gifted education is a passionless issue in a society geared to emergencies. That was our onus in 1970. I still believe it is today. People do not think that bright kids need anything different than what they're getting in school. Does anybody have a response to that? <laughs> well, you can ask another question because we've got like one minute. One minute. <laughs> Oh, let me see if we have any from the, the Actually, audience. Can, can I, and while you look at that, I'll jump in for a second. Because okay. one of the things that you're, somebody said, I think Gail said, how are we going to change the teacher to become, the teacher needs to be the go-to person, or uh, needs to be. And, and so I, I do, I offer after-school workshops like two, three times a week, and then all summer. But just 
last week I, off, I offered one and they're called gifted on the go. So I offered one, it was called the culturally responsive teacher. I had 90 teachers sign up for it. They want it. They're, they're hungry for they it. Absolutely Dina, you're, you're, you're exactly right. I do a program this summer with uh, the Achievement Gap Institute. You can look at on, on Facebook and just, I mean, uh, YouTube and just do a uh, Achievement Gap, uh, Bridge to Achievement Gap, whatever it is. Uh, but that's right. I had students from all over the country come to Vanderbilt for a week to do these kind of workshops. And they were, like you said, they want more. There are still those pockets of folks who are going to be stuck in the in 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 in, in doing what they're doing. And I get that. I understand that. But how do we start to build that cadre, build that team of folks who are actually saying, okay, this is what the kids are doing now. I love when somebody said that instead of adjusting, having the kids adapt to the school, the school adapt to the kids because they're new children now. I mean, with this iPhone or this so whatever phone you have, kids are walking around with more information than they had to go to the doggone moon. So we have to take that into consideration with gifted kids, right? How do we keep them engaged? So I was able to access ESSER funds to actually hire this lady. She was so dynamic and amazing um, as a teacher, but, but also just, so there's funds out there. And if you can attach them to a need right now and you can defend that need, we can make a change with our teachers' perceptions and understanding and get them away from the tatuati. You know, the, that's where we've always done it. So we are, we are uh, hit our time, but I, I, you guys don't mind going over just a smidge for a couple questions. Um, would you be willing to do that for a few more minutes? Sure. Okay, so I'm gonna pop up to, I'm scrolling because there have been so many wonderful comments. Um, Jen, Strickland asks, does it seem that we as advocates will ever achieve getting a legal definition of gifted? And maybe by legal, she means federal because states have their different legal, legal definitions. Um, with a clear cut line that stating that gifted education does not necessarily always equal high achieving and perhaps we can focus on adapting more for them instead of just finding the Hermione's Harry Potter reference there. <laughs> Let me offer us a a very different uh, response to this. <clears throat> I mentioned that my wife is the CEO of an uh, organization based in DC. Uh, prior to that, one of her jobs was Assistant Secretary of Education for the country in charge of K-12 education for the nation. Right before uh, Biden took office, there was a meeting of the transition team for education. And there were about 100 folks on this uh, call, the Zoom meeting. And special ed was identified, Title I was identified, there were people speaking up, college career ready, you name it. The one glaring omission was anyone dealing with gifted kids. If we're not in the room, if we're not at the table, and we aren't, then nothing much is going to change in terms of legislation at the state or federal level. The states will say if the feds don't care enough to have a definition and a policy, why should we? And to have her on this call with the transition team trying to say this is what we need to do to make education as best we can and the gifted voice was nowhere to be heard that's just silly yep and it just always says all gifted is local right but that's right if you define it you have to pay for it that's right you see if you that's actually right. put up the policy and the legislation from the national level uh, there will be states to push back against it because there are people being served and they fi feel it fine to be served. And, and even though it's disproportionate serving, you understand? So in order to actually um, make it a federal mandate, uh, because and I'm missing this report, which I'll throw in the, in the chat in a second, we look at that and we look at the states and all the laws of all the states. So if you ever want to look at this as a free download, I'll put it in there for you to check it out. Uh, some work that my colleague, uh, Marsha Gentry and, and several of us did at Purdue uh, 2019, I think is something that lets us know that we have disparity in this nation. And I think the nation knows about it at the federal level, but how do we get, I mean, I'm, I'm talking right now with uh, Julia Nyberg out there in California, and they're battling right now because they're trying to do something with the, the math requirements that's going to take out the, uh, uh, the, the high level math uh, for black and brown kid, kids out there in the public schools. And this is like 70, 80% of the population. 
So she's asking people to advocate, write letters and all that kind of stuff for them. So she's also talking about the Castro bill that's out that's right now that we're ignoring. So there's legislation that's out there, but we haven't yet come together as a group or body or an organization to actually push that thing and make it happen. I think we're still operating kind of like that. The you know the the individual lines are still being drawn uh, between the haves and and the wants. Thank you. <clears throat> Cashless issue and a society geared to emergencies. Anybody else have a response to that? I think uh, Gil uh, said it best. Uh, Anne quoted you, uh, if you define it, you have to pay for it. And I think also, I think Gil kind of touched on and, and we've been touching on and not really directly addressing it tonight. Um, and some of the questions and comments in the chat that I, I can't find again because our chat is pretty extensive and long, um, have to deal with, with equity. And I think touching on that elimination of gifted programs um, and opportunities for high level math and, and science classes that Gil mentioned and um, Linda's uh, uh, work on eliminating um, gifted programs, increasing inequity and how how do we address those inequities? And again, if you define it, you have to pay for it. So if we define it, then we have to maybe make some shifts in how we do, how we do things in gifted ed and how we identify students and how we serve students. And um, I think that's work a lot of us want to tackle, but Jim's right, we have to get to the table. So any, any other contributions you have onto you know, how we work towards equity, inclusion, and gift education when it's not federally mandated. And maybe part of that is moving forward with some federal advocacy. We can't wait until that until, until we have federal funding. We can't wait. It's not going to happen. We can't, I'm in a state that doesn't fund uh, gifted well, one year out of every 10, maybe. It's allocating your existing resources to make sure you're meeting the needs of all students. And you have to figure out what those needs are and you have to be willing to say, we have no money. Arizona is like the second to the poorest funded state in, in the country. It, it's using what you, understandings that you know are right and serving these kids because they're all our kids in our schools and they deserve an education, whether they're identified or not, brown, black, white, doesn't matter. It's just doing what's right for the kids and getting that message and that's where the label kind of hurts us a little bit sometimes, um, but we can't wait till there's funding. I'm wondering if Michelle Obama can help us. I don't know. I just finished reading her book, Be Becoming, and it really, it, it, it's just my new Bible. Do you, do you have her number, Linda? Can you give her a call? Right, right. Call, call up, tell, hey, let's, let's get this working. Let's get this working. <laughs> No, I, 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 she, she's such, so obviously a gifted woman. She's so much a talent scout. She really cares. I, I, Linda, I think we have, and, and Jill Biden, I think we have somebody even closer to the source, if you will. And I oh, think yeah. Jill, Jill, Jill and uh, Michelle could be a dynamic duo to, to get, get stuff popping. So get on the phone, give them a holla. Yeah. And tell yeah, them that, uh, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, but I, Dina, I, I, Dina, I want to concur before you, before we run off here and say that I totally agree with you. Uh, Martin Luther King wrote a book called "Why We Can't Wait," and this is exactly one of those moments why we can't wait because we've been waiting since you know we we've heard Linda say she's been here since '61, and some of the research I do goes back to 1920s, and we're still seeing some of these new kind of disparities happening. We're seeing the, not the funding coming down for the whole organization, but then we're seeing these bridges. One of our questions we we're going to talk about was the equity inclusion of our gifted identification, and that becomes a hot button issue because that is the that is the issue of tomorrow that will decide whether or not we'll have it at all. Because this whole stretch of that we're doing with creating uh, these uh, charter schools and these things, and we're, we're taking public dollars out of public schools and creating small private schools that operate on public dollars, draining and leaving those who need the most with the least. And that, 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 can't, that can't continue to happen. And that's not gonna happen at the national level. That's gonna happen in each, not even each uh, school district, that's almost in school buildings. You know, we all have to get the mayors on board. But again, it's political. We can't forget, this is a political football, a hot potato rather. 
hot potato. That's a, that's a great, yeah. Hot potato. I, I don't know if we want to leave everybody on that, on the hot potato. Um, does well, anybody? I, have I, I would like to throw <laughs> in my, my wish list. I, I, Cause I think it's a, a more positive way to end it anyway. I believe that these kids are out there. I believe that we have to find them. And I believe that we can find them. And that's my mission. I'm, I'm on a mission. I want to try a whole bunch of different kinds of assessment tools. In addition to testing, and I have access to a lot of different kinds of tests, but we have qualitative methods like gifted qualitative assessment and the world game. And I want to, if there's money out there, I want to use some of that money to find these kids that are there that we're missing because we can be talent searches, but we're not, we're not going about it the right way or we would have found more of these kids. So, there. so one of the obstacles I think in our field is that if it's not my idea, it's wrong. I mean, us is, is Amen. we have to be more accepting, understanding. We teach that to our kids. There's multiple approaches. There's multiple ways to address, to, to solve this problem, to address this. Yet, if it's somebody else thinks about it or somebody else's idea, then it's gotta be wrong because it's, it counters my approach. So right. I think that we just have to be and in our field. Doing. In our field, we have to be more accepting of others and open to um, different ideas, different yeah. approaches. And one thing I think that we haven't really talked about specifically that would really be a benefit to, to our field is to just listen to the kids. Uh, Linda and I did a session, what, about a year ago, maybe through, through CAG-T, where I had a panel of, I think, four or five high school students just talking about the impact of Gifted on their lives. Uh, as I said, Wheat Ridge High School in the Jeffco in Colorado just did that last week with more than 130 uh, former students. I think some of the best advocates are the kids themselves who either are in or have been in services for gifted kids. And to just, the voice of a child is so much more powerful than the voice of a paid adult. And I just think we, not to use them, but to who better to know whether we've done anything right than the kids who got our services. So I think without exploiting them, we need to really use the power of their voices to send the message that we're trying to send here tonight. So Jim and, I think, and ask, I think we have to ask the kids what they need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah not just because they, their voices are so powerful, but because what we do with them should be based on what they tell us they need. Duh. So something something that uh, both of you said about the voices and also Dina with the qualitative work, that's my background is qualitative research methods. So I think that that uh, what we just call that prior life uh, learning or that holistic look at a child to actually assess giftedness is something that needs to be considered, not just one score. It was never designed to be just one score. All the way back to Bonet in France, it was never supposed to be one score. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we changed ourselves here. Uh, we also talk about the gifted child's voice. I don't do this. Everybody knows me. I never put this out there, but my daughter is uh, also a Jenkins scholar. She's a gifted young lady. Uh, she's written two books. I just threw one up in the chat just now. Uh, and what would you say if I could? Yes, these are regular published books with uh, pub push, uh, presses. And uh, this one is heavy. What would you say if you could? It talks about the, the vision of, she's a Nashville Youth Poet Laureate, Youth, Youth Poet Laureate Ambassador for US. So when you wanna hear a child's voice, that's something you wanna take a look at. But get some of those things, look at the kids' voices because we have to think about what are the texts that our kids are reading. We had uh, here in Nashville, they just took down a building moniker that used to say the Confederate Memorial Hall, which was put up in the 1930s by the uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy. And they actually did so much to create the curriculum that we are still using today. And these are Daughters of the Confederacy and went all across the United States. So our curriculum in our schools can be more engaging because by the time they get out of fifth grade, something like that, that's when they actually engaged in academics. That's why I have that scholar identity model. How do we help create that? That is the, the, the social emotional connection that a lot of these kids who are missing from education 
have. We just can't learn about the trail of tears. We just can't learn about slavery. We have to learn about all of the great things that we do. We can't talk about Edison if we can't talk about somebody who helped build a filament inside the light bulb for Edison. We can't talk about just half the picture, in this case, half the sky. And I'm going to shamelessly plug Tag T here. We have recently opened um, officially as part of our board two student liaison positions um, on CAG T. We are seeking a metro and a rural position. Um, these students could be any high school student who's identified um, in their school district. Um, and we would, we think we need to elevate those voices of students and we will be seeking applications. Um, information has gone out to regional and local uh, gifted specialists. But if you are a parent or an educator of gifted individuals listening tonight, reach out to our association, um, either through the Facebook or through our website and find out more about this because I think there's a huge point to elevating those student voices and asking what students wanna hear. And there is power in their experience. So my goodness, it is 6.15 and I told Linda that's when we'd end tonight. <laughs> um, I have to go figure out what the heck's for dinner. And um, I think I will just let everybody get on with their evening. But you guys, I can't, I, I, I urge you to get on Facebook. Gil has been on, but uh, Dina and Linda and Jim, I urge you to get on here and see all the fabulous, wonderful hundreds of comments that you've received this <laughs> evening. If you're not on Facebook, find someone who is and have them look it up. Or I will send you a transcript of all the wonderful um, comments that you have received. I'm not on Facebook, you'll have to help me with that. I, I'll, you know get, what? Get, get to me. Email me. Text message me. I'll get it. My email address is right there. Uh, okay. Linda G. <laughs> Way and Van Madonna. Hit me up and we'll get on here one on one. I'll bring you on the screen and we'll walk through it. I'll hook you up. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Gil. And you guys are incredible. I appreciate so much that you have taken the time out of your evening to share in this dialogue. We tackled some tough questions. I think we had a great time. I think we have work to do. Um, but first, dinner. So, uh, thank you, Cag T, for having us. I appreciate it. Uh, my name's Linda, Dina. Hope to see you all at NAGC in November or somewhere online, I'm sure, between. Absolutely. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for logging in from home. We appreciate it for logging in at home. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. Everyone, have a wonderful evening. Bye, everybody.